Dave, um, I'm really happy to have you on the podcast. I followed you for quite some time, and I've only really been able to talk to you through the camera lens. I'd say a handful of times on Fox, but I feel like I've known you or obviously known of you for quite some time. So I'm excited to have you here today to hang out for a little while. Well, thanks for having me, Will. I feel very overdressed, though, I have to say. You're, you're rocking the T-shirt podcast style. You are off right. Fox for the moment. You get to yeah. be a real person. I've been doing 8,000 shows today because of the, uh, the book launch, so I'm still, I'm still professional garb. I feel, should I run downstairs and get a uh, tank top? What do you think? No, no. I've already seen people accuse me of looking like Dave Rubin. We can go <laughs> ahead and separate <laughs> I've, our I've heard attire. It before. I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> we can separate our attire. Okay, so it's bad form to start an interview with a story, but that's what I'm going to do. So I want to tell you about a business that I started, and there's a reason I'm going to tell you about this. But somewhere in my entrepreneurial history, I started a business for young Latinas, young girls of Hispanic heritage who are turning 15. I, I started a business to help them plan their quinceanera. And here's how I ended up doing this, Dave. Um, I knew I wanted to be involved in a growing demographic, and I realized that the term Hispanic means nothing. It's a government census-created term that masks over the differences of somebody from, say, Cuba and Chile. And it also treats people as though they're first-generation and fifth-generation immigrants exactly the same. So I needed to find something that was truly a connection between all of the ethnicities that we colloquially – called Hispanic. You know, one of the things I find fascinating about you is you are an openly gay, non-progressive, maybe self-described conservative now, definitely libertarian. And as we watch the world move into this ever-expanding acronym of LGBTQIA+, what I think we have begun to do is treat every letter in that acronym as though it's a monolith, in the same way we did with Hispanic. We were wrong to assume somebody from Cuba had the exact same cultural interests as somebody from Venezuela. And I'm just wondering, as someone who's openly gay, obviously you have your political differences with that agenda, but I have to think, even beyond whatever you believe politically, we're making a mistake by assuming someone who is gay and someone who is trans should be treated in the exact same political demographic. I didn't know where you were going with that. I thought this was you getting advice <laughs> on how to set up a quinceanera. I could give you a pretty good Spotify playlist, but that's about it. Uh, but to your question, though, it is a great question that I think in many ways hits on so much of what is wrong with pretty much everything right now. So I do happen to be gay. I am married to a guy. We've been together for 12, 13 years already. We're working on having kids over the next couple months, which is a whole other story. Uh, but that is just one little part of me. Uh, it's something actually that I struggled with for a long time because people always say to me, oh, Dave, it's so great. You, you don't seem gay. They always say that as a, uh, as a positive. You don't, you don't seem gay. I guess my <laughs> affect isn't that feminine or something like that. I know plenty of people that are effeminate that are gay. I know effeminate guys that are straight. I know guys that don't seem gay that are gay. Uh, you know, Peter Thiel is not the most gay acting person in the world. There's this weird conglomeration of all of, of how people act and, and what their sexuality may or may not be. Uh, but related to the, to the alphabet craziness that we've gone through, here's the simple truth. Me as a gay man and you as a straight man, I have no more insight into what it is like to be trans than you do. They just right. happen to have put these letters together. So, for example, I am in the body I am supposed to be in. You are in the body that you are supposed to be in. And then there is sexuality, which is about attraction. OK, now someone may have a religious uh, opinion on that. Someone may uh, accept it. That's a separate issue. Uh, but the trans issue, the idea that your psychology, your psychological makeup is disconnected from your physical biology, and thus we no longer believe in biology anymore, or if you're going to be on the Supreme Court, you can't even say what a woman is because you're not a biologist, uh, this causes a huge problem. So you may have seen uh, on The View this week, they had Pete Buttigieg on, our 
transportation secretary. I always call him Gay Pete on the show because the only reason he got the job is because he's gay. They, they pretty much said that. I mean, the guy was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He has no qualifications whatsoever, but they were very excited. We had the first gay transportation secretary. Now we have all sorts of supply chain problems and whatever else, but okay. Well, he was on it. Anna Navarro, uh, who is uh, a real piece of work, that one, she said, well, Pete, you are, you are LGBT. I think she said you are LGBTQI+, which nobody knows what the hell that means. But she, lo- but she didn't say you're a member of that community. Now, first off, it's not a community for exactly what you just said right there. The, the, the first generation Cuban has nothing to do with the third generation Chilean, right? Other than right. Spanish, roughly, something like that. But you jam all of these people together into these ridiculous alphabet soups. And then you think that you're creating something stronger. So I'm guessing, Will, I'm guessing you were roughly the same age. I have a feeling you're a little younger than me. But I grew up on the Transformers before when they were cool Transformers, not not Michael Bay Transformers, the cartoons. And there were Transformers called the Constructicons. These were Decepticons who there were five of them. One was a dump truck. One was uh, they were all different uh, construction uh, trucks and they could they formed Devastator. He was the bigger truck. That's Uh what these people have tried to do with LGBT. They think if we can take these different groups that don't have that much in common with each other, but we sort of roughly think they do because they're outliers from a, from a sexuality perspective. If we can just combine them into something together, they'll be stronger. The truth is they're actually much weaker and not only much weaker, but it's, it's inhuman. No one is based. Nobody's prime driver in their life is the color of their skin or their sexuality or their gender or anything else. You are the sum totality of all of the things that you think and how you act. And the fact that they've pushed this on everybody where that is the most important thing. And we, we should have Supreme court justices because of the color of their skin. We should hire people based on their gender and we should punish Asian kids from going to Harvard because we've had too many Asians here it's racism. It, it's not mm-hmm. new racism. It's old racism, but they, you know, dusted it up a little bit and put a dress on it. So, no, I have nothing to do with I, I hate those phrases. The black community. The black, what does that mean? Thomas Sowell has nothing or Larry Elder have nothing to do with Al Sharpton. They happen to have the same skin color. But are we so devolved that that's what we're going to focus on? I mean, it's all crazy. I like so much of what you had to say right there, and I think you're absolutely right. But you said nobody's prime motivator in life is their identity. I'm curious, do you did you mean that exactly as you said it, or did you mean it nobody's prime driver in life should be should. their identity? Because <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering so, if I'm yeah. wondering if more and more people aren't defining their identity or defining their prime motivator in life by their superficial identity. Yeah, you know, it's funny because obviously we do a very similar thing for a living. I find when I'm trying to uh, talk about the news or talk about the ideas I care about, I'm always trying to figure out a way to make it, to spin it positively. Otherwise, it's like, man, why would people always be tuning into us? Because there's plenty of guys that do what we do to make everybody angry and outraged and everything else. You're one of the guys that, that doesn't do that, which is very hard to do on cable news and keep people watching because there's a degree of you have to kind of keep everybody in like a, a certain state, a certain frenzy in some ways. Tucker is very good at it too. You know, he'll do things with a smile and, and be joking, which is why the CNN people are so obsessed with him because there's this need to, to keep everybody angry. So when I say, I should have said should, the reason I yeah. didn't is because I try to do this in, an, in a sort of aspirational way where it's, we all know that we should not be using our skin color and, and all of that as the primary thing about us. But yes, many people do the woke ideology, which has infected everything across the board, our cultural institutions, political, educational, uh, the corporate institutions, all of our entertainment, music, the whole thing. Yes, they have pushed something upon us that has confused young people and, and confused old people, too. Uh, and successfully. Vid- yeah, I, I don't know if you saw that video so. of the, uh, the, did you see the video of the Disney CEO groveling? to the LGBTQ Mm -hmm. employees. And it's like, man, you became the CEO of Disney, Bob Chappick. You you have a pedigree in business, one of the most powerful corporate executives in the world. And you are bowing to your employees because of this woke collective nonsense 
that you've allowed to infiltrate your company. And congratulations, it's going to take you out and possibly take down Disney, as it should. You know, the other thing that you said that I really like is you said being gay is just one small slice of who I am. Uh, Rachel Campos Duffy, who's my host on Fox and Friends on the Weekend, and I were having this conversation. And Rachel said, you know, why is it that because I'm Latino, I'm supposed to connect with every other Latino in a way that I don't (laughs) say with you or Pete? She said the values that you and Pete and I share and our aspirations for this world, our faith, are so many deeper lying connections than could possibly exist just simply because you have ethnic or cultural connections. And not to say those aren't real. Those are real as well. But why are those the ones that are supposedly 80 to 90 percent of who we are when, as what you said, it's really only one small sliver of who you are and totally divorces you from your ideas, your values, your aspirations, your ambitions. I like that you said that's just one small part of who I am. Well, we all know this, and this is the stuff that most of our ancestors came to America to escape. I mean, that really is it. You know, most of us in America, unless you are the descendants of slaves who were brought here, and, and we can discuss that, but it's a separate issue, but most of us who came here, uh, whether you're a first-generation Mexican immigrant right now, or you're a fifth-generation Italian immigrant, or you're from West India, or Eastern Europe, doesn't matter, your, your, your ancestors came here, in essence, to escape collectivism of one, kind or, of, of one kind, I should say, or another, because collectivism was the set of ideas that was rampaging throughout the world, all over the world. Now, we've done a weird thing where we've combined collectivism, old school collectivism or socialism was an economic system. Now we have this very weird version of it where it's based in identity as well. So we used to have collectivism, so it was purely sort of economic, the people versus the system and the powerful versus the poor, that sort of thing. We've now combined it with gender and with skin color and the rest of it. But nobody wants to be judged on that. Rachel's completely right. Of course she's completely right. I I have friends that are Latina, for whatever the phrase is worth. I have friends that are gay. I have friends that are black and straight and white. And none of, it's just completely irrelevant. I mean, imagine how depressing it would be. If, you know, it's Friday night, Friday afternoon, and you and you and your wife are like, yeah, you know, what are we going to do this weekend? The kids are out of town. Maybe we'll have some friends over. Let, let's look up the black friends, see if we can get some black friends over. Like, nobody thinks like this. Nobody behaves like this. <laughs> it's complete and utter nonsense. But the machine is pushing it on us. So the real question, I think, is why is the machine pushing it on us the way that it is? So why is it? Well, it's an easy way to control us. I mean, I think that that is probably the easiest answer. I think there's many answers to it, how somehow wokeism got so uh, ingrained in the educational institutions, how it moved up into the cultural institutions, how it how it pushed everything through big tech and algorithms and all of those things. But it's a very easy way of controlling people. You know, all of these young people that for two years uh, were out there protesting Black Lives Matter, and they had no idea related to anything when it came to police uh, statistics, you know, shooting unarmed black men. It was something, in 2018, it was something like 12 men, something like that. But, but if you ask the average person, they think it's, they think it's a ton. Then they mm-hmm. think also that, you know, because of things like the 1619 Project, that the entire foundation of America was based in racism. All of these things... They're designed to keep everyone angry, keep everyone suspect of everything, keep everyone sitting in America in 2022, the greatest country in the history of the world, which is why nobody leaves, right? Remember, everybody was going to leave when Trump became president and nobody left after four years and an awful lot of people wish he was president again right now because it's obviously significantly worse. Um, But they've undermined it. They've undermined people to the point that they can sit in the most privileged place in the history of the world and think that something's wrong with it uh, because freedom's messy. Freedom's messy. It takes more work to, to push the ideas that we think are the good ideas. You and know, you won't I go back and if you push those ideas. You know, I go back and forth on this, Dave, you know, on how coordinated the division is created. I think that human beings are attracted to the easiest path. I think it's the story of humanity. I don't want to take the high road. I don't want to take the hard road. I want to take the low road, and I want to take the easy road. It takes real effort to will yourself down the hard road. What I'm getting at is I think in order to 
the appeal to victimhood is easy because you absolve yourself of responsibility for your mm-hmm. status in life. And the appeal of maybe those kids at the BLM protest who know nothing about the background is that it's an easy path to unearned virtue. So I think at least at the grassroots level or at the bottom up, I I think there's a lot of people attracted to the woke movement because of the ease of virtue and the ease of victimhood. I don't know. I generally am somebody that stays away from conspiracy, not because they are controversial. And in fact, I think conspiracy theorists are on a hot run the last couple of years, but rather I stay away (laughs) from (laughs) conspiracy. They're doing pretty well, better than the experts. Um, I think I stay away from conspiracy because most of the time it's 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 just too difficult to pull off a conspiracy. Nobody can stay quiet. Um, it's too hard to coordinate. But I do wonder from where and to whose benefit are we divided that it makes these grassroots easy paths available? I don't know academia. I don't know uh, politics. But there are certainly beneficiaries of our division. I just don't know how coordinated that effort has yeah. become. So that always is the billion dollar question. I I cover this a lot on my show and I think you're right. I think humans are inclined to always take the easier path. I mean, that's why most people don't do what they're supposed to do in life and most people know it. Most people end up living with that regret. As you know, I toured with Jordan Peterson for a year and a half. He spent most of his lecture time talking about something around that. You can do something great in your life. You have to look for it. You have to find it. You have to go to it. And if you go to it, It's going to be hard. It's going to be work. There's going to be failure, but there will be learning. There will be process. There will be an expansion of the things that are good within you. And you may not get that thing, but you might get something that's kind of near that thing. And that's pretty Mm -hmm. good. That's what the human experience is. But most humans, we all take the easy way out to some degree or another, or we all have moments in our life when it's just better to do that. Now you throw in for young people, you throw in just the general idea of wanting to be liked, wanting to fit Mm -hmm. in just, you know, what, what high school was. Now you put some algorithms on top of that where, you know, if you just post the right black square the day they want you to post the black square, you're going to get an awful lot of likes. If you just say the thing that they want you to say, you're going to get a lot of clicks. Now, so that's where some of the coordination might. So real quick, Dave, on that, then let's apply that same rationale to what's going on in the current news cycle. So we can go back to what you referenced with Disney or in what you're referencing Instagram with the black square. Do you think that's corporations taking the easy path to public virtue or do you think that's a concerted conspiratorial effort to push certain values is bob chapik groveling because it's the easiest way out of his current predicament or because he truly believes in this lgbtqia agenda so i definitely don't think it is the latter but it might be a tiny bit of both so there's no way that bob chapik believes this stuff and the way you know that none of these people believe this stuff is that the, all of these people have had long, successful careers where they've never talked about these things, and then suddenly, right. Right. and then suddenly, out of nowhere, they devote their life to the thing, and right. that's not how being an adult works. So, a good example of this also would be John Stewart. John Stewart was for twenty years sort of the mainstream liberal of America, and like him or hate him, that he was the guy. And what was the meme about the Daily Show? It was always hey, more Ameri- more young Americans get their news from the Daily Show than anywhere else. That's what everyone kept saying. Then John Stewart disappears for five years. He comes back in this past year, and now he's doing the woke thing. He's doing dear white people, and white people are all racist, and white white farmers this, and blah, blah, blah. Now, is it possible, is it, just to give the devil his due, is it possible that John Stewart suddenly had the most incredible political awakening while he was away over these last couple years, and he suddenly came to believe that America is fundamentally racist and all this, or, now I don't think that's possible actually, or is it possible that he kept going down the path of leftism, he kept going down that thing, and once he got there, where he is now, when he's a rich, I think he's worth about $100 million, uh, middle-aged white guy, he now Mm -hmm. is in a situation that is very similar to the Bob Chappick situation. He has surrounded himself with all activists and sycophants, and if he is to say anything against that, they will destroy him too. Yeah. That's why Bob Chapik sat in that Zoom video as if he was a hostage. The guy is, I'm sure, worth way more money than you and I combined many times over. He could do whatever he wants for a living, but life is strange. And somehow 
He let a whole bunch of bad ideas into his company, and now those bad ideas, those bad pathogens that are in the system, the parasite that is in the system, they're eating the system alive, and he, he's not a man. He's not a man anymore that would face this thing down and fight it. He's just going to be another person tossed aside in the name of wokeism. Oh, that's really good. And I think what your answer to me then was, it is actually both. So, so um, let's go back to John Stewart. Is it possible that John Stewart had a political awakening in the last two to three years? I think the answer to that might actually be yes, because progressivism is the never-ending revolution. I think they're pretty aware that whatever ideas they hold today could be out of fashion tomorrow. And the job of progressivism is to always stay in fashion. Yes, It's totally divorced from principle. The closest principle that progressivism could hold true to at the grassroots level would be something like empathy and tolerance but that that even even that is 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 a false god if nothing else because we saw that with censorship and and everything else so i don't i do think that john stewart is willing to accept the daily movements of the revolution but then kind of what you what you point out is the system and what again whether or not it's coordinated or conspiratorial mm-hmm. it's set up so it's always reinforcing bubble right so you 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 live in New York. You live in Brooklyn. You work in media. You work at Disney. Every single input coming at you from every which way, including yep. business, is telling you keep up with the revolution. So it's I think it's simultaneously cynical and probably to some extent ideological, meaning true belief. Yes. So that is a great point because. It is possible that he has, let's say he did, it's, it's very weird also. I mean, most people don't move left the later th- they get in age. As you get older, generally people become a little more conservative. You start learning a little bit more about the world. You start realizing that generations before you had something valuable to say, often fought and died for something valuable. So that's why people tilt towards conservative as they get older, or at least more conservative than they once were. It's very rare that you find someone tilt the other way. So Bill Maher would be a good example on the counter of that. Bill Maher, who's been a lefty his whole life, but I would consider him an old school liberal. uh, He has obviously now tilted more. See, it's not exactly conservative. He's tilted not insane. And that's what sounds like conservative now. So it's not that Bill Maher is a conservative. If you were to, you know, sign him up for the Republican Party, all this stuff is going to work. But what is Bill Maher good at? He's gone on free speech. He hates CRT. He suddenly came out against lockdowns. He believes that there are two genders. Uh, he believes that two plus two equals five, four. He's, he's got the main stuff in order. Now, to a modern ear, it's kind of sounding like he's a conservative. Now, he doesn't get it on big government yet, and he still, unfortunately, calls Republicans racist every two seconds. But his evolution, I would say, is a little more honest. I think you're right on the John Stewart thing. And you also have to remember... On a business side, you know, Apple TV, I think that's where Jon Stewart's show is. I'm sure they're giving him, let's say, 10 million bucks a year. Were they going to give 10 million bucks a year to anyone that was thought of as right leaning or centrist or anything else? So if he wanted, right. I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be that cynical. I'm, I'm not saying he's a sellout or something, but if the guy wanted to be dealt back in and get a nice check for it, which way are you going to go? Are you going to have to, are you going to do what I did and have to build your own thing over a long time outside of the system? Or are you going to have to do what you did where you're going to work for an awful long time to finally get the great mm-hmm. gig that you've got now? Or do you just kind of give the system what it wants and then guess what? The system will pay you handsomely for it. So it's, Actually, that's it's a where little I bit go. of all of those things. And that's where I want to go next with you. So, by the way, a couple of things to, to clean up. I'm older than you. I know this because I did some research How on old you. Are you? By, wo- by one year. I'm, I was born in 75. Year. You're 76. I was going to say yeah. you were 42. <laughs> that was going to be my guess. You're doing, but that you're doing year must right. have been something because I'll tell you this. I was into Star Wars and G.I. Joe. My younger brother, who's 78, born in 78, was Transformers and He-Man. And so it sounds like you were <laughs> Transformers. I don't know if you were into He-Man, but um, – we, yeah, you, you were, I, had, I had an off. I had trap jaw, I had beast man, and uh, yeah. man at arms. The whole crew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, My brother was seventy nine, so yeah, we got all the same toys <laughs> in our at our parents' house. I'm sure. So, um, I, so I, I wanted to ask you about this. So, you you had a viral video. It's one of your most viral videos, which you did for PragerU, which is why I left the left. Um, but you went through this transformation we're talking about with Bill Maher way before sort of whatever's happening right now. And by the way, Dave, I think the speed of the progressive revolution has picked up pace in the last two to three years. And that's why we're seeing people like Bill Maher, 
Andrew Sullivan, Matt Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald, all of a sudden going, whoa. I mean, they all of a sudden it moved so far so fast it left a whole wake of people who used to would have called themselves, I don't even think moderately left. For some of those guys, they would have said they were pretty far left. And now Glenn, all of a sudden. Glenn, yeah, Glenn Greenwald. Glenn was bananas lefty. <laughs> He was right. bananas lefty. He used to call me a racist on Twitter all the time. Now he's just repeating everything I said five years ago. <laughs> well, okay. So what? So first of all, from an ideological standpoint, what was the big moment for you? I mean, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was gradual. What was the issue or the moment that brought you from the left into sanity? So there, there were a couple things. Um, as you probably know, I was on the Young Turks Network, which is a far mm-hmm. left YouTube channel. I was a Bernie supporter, the whole thing. There were a few key moments um, that I've told many stories about. I'll tell you one that's a a slightly lesser known one, but I'm sure you're going to know the guy I'm talking about. I was on air one day at the Young Turks. There were about four hosts uh, doing this big panel thing. And they would always basically, the whole show was devoted to what did Fox News do and how can we critique them because we're going to get a lot of clicks off of Fox News. So they're playing a clip where my good friend, uh, and I'm guessing you know him, David Webb. You must know David, right? Or at least have have crossed paths with David over the years. Yeah, David's a great guy. He happens to be a conservative who is black. Um, And he was guest hosting for Hannity one day. And they're playing a clip of him. And what they did not know, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this way first. So they play the clip of him and they, it doesn't even matter what he was saying. They immediately come back from the clip and they're calling him an Uncle Tom and he's a sellout. And, you know, he just wants money. And how could a black person say this? Blah, blah, blah. What they did not know is that years before, I had a show on Sirius XM, as David still has a show on Sirius XM. I was a lefty at the time. He was on the right. But I bumped into him in the hallway. This is a totally true story. Bumped into him in the hallway one day. We started talking. He said, hey, why don't you come on my show? We'll do something once a week. We'll just talk it out, you know, see what happens. We did that for probably two years, once a week. We became very good friends. We, we would go downstairs after the show to Del Frisco's, have a steak and some whiskey, And Uh that's when I was a lefty. He was on the right. We didn't agree on anything, but he's become a very, very close friend of mine. So now, flash forward, it's a couple years later. I'm sitting on this panel, and I'm watching these supposed tolerant, lefty, open-minded, diverse people call this guy who I know a sellout and an Uncle Tom and all the bad things you could say. And then it completely hit me. It It was so crystal clear. You know when you get just that slap in life, and you're like, bam, now I get it? It was like, wait a minute. You guys are the racists. I know Dave. He is a good man. He has fought honestly for the positions he, be- he believes in, and I know he believes in them, and it ain't easy to do what he's doing. What you guys are doing is easy, to say, oh, black man must think this way, and that if he doesn't, you think you have the right to call him all of the worst things. It's a new type of racism. So that was one of a couple events that broke it for me, because that one, it was very personal. It wasn't just like seeing a guy in a cable news box. It was very right. clear, man. I know this guy. He, he is a good man. And look at, look at you guys in the name of tolerance and diversity, what you think you can say about him. Would you have ever, when you were on the left, would you have ever described yourself as someone who affiliated with identity politics at that time? Was it, I am gay, therefore I am on the left? Or what, was that a big primary driver for you at one point in your life? Why did you, why were you on the left? Yeah. So first on the on the gay thing, there was a little of that and a little of that I think is warranted because there was not full equality under the law. If you were going to say to two consenting adults, you cannot get married, you cannot figure out a way to have a family. Not only are there um, there's obviously financial reasons that you, you want to get married be, beyond all the reasons that we all know that you want to be in a stable relationship. There are tax reasons that you want to get married and be in a relationship Mm -hmm. and things like that. So from a purely equality perspective, I believe that two consenting adults should be able to engage in any contract that they want, just like anyone else, regardless of their sexuality or skin color or whatever. I also believe that people are entitled to their personal religious liberty and don't have to get gay married if they don't want to. So that's fine. That's completely fine, too, in my world. Uh, But before gay marriage, there was sort of a progressives were screaming about it in a very passionate way. So I think a little of that did dupe me because I felt, Hmm. oh, here are the people that that scream the most. They have righteous indignation and they are really fighting for what's right. Now, the problem is, and this will link to what you uh, first asked me when we started. The problem is once you get equality, that's it. You got to the promised land and now you got to let go. 
but that's what they've refused to do. There is no one in the United States that does not is not treated equally under the law by the by the color of their skin or by their sexuality or by their gender. And that includes trans people, uh, which we're obsessed with talking about a group that is basically point zero zero one percent of the population. That that also goes to what you were talking about, about coordinated or what. Um, but, you know, Chris Rock had a great line from a stand up special about 15 years ago. The cops need a certain amount of crime. And the problem is that when progressives are fighting for equality, the, the old left, the ACLU left, fighting for equality for all people. We want mm -hmm. black people to be able to vote. We want women to be able to vote. We want gay people to get married. That's pretty good. But once you move, and that's liberal, by the way, that's the true liberal position. But once you move from equality to equity, which is what we have now, instead you're just chopping everybody down. So in the name of equity, you literally have Harvard punishing Asian students because there are too many Asians in their mind. So they punish Asian students. What, what is fair or equal or American about that? Absolutely nothing. So that's so that's so interesting. So what you're saying is once the goal is accomplished, there is a self-preservation necessity to find the yes. next pursuit of injustice. And that has moved from equality to equity. I know you are someone, for example, who are opposed to um, or rather in support of Florida's parental rights in education to keep teachers from talking to young kids about sexuality or trans issues or gender identity up through third grade. I personally think it should be older, fifth grade. I don't know. But um, I don't know why a stranger should be talking to you about I think you can make that issues. argument. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but do you Listen, think I'm that, Dave? I'm completely with you on that? that. We can discuss where that is, yeah. Yeah, so what is that movement? So you leave at the equality mo moment of the of the gay marriage issue, but the movement goes on, right? And and so what's the purpose now? If quality is accomplished, I mean, we can call it equity. I guess that's what the pursuit is. But the, it's equity. Go ahead. It's go ahead. equity, yeah. which is it. Yeah, it's equity, which is very different. Equality. We all know what equality is. Equality is the great promise of America. A right. promise, by the way, that America did not always live up to. We had slaves. We obviously were not all no treated doubt. equally. Then we freed the slaves. We fought for all of the things to get people right and get people equal. That, by the way, that doesn't mean, obviously, that your starting place is exactly the same point. Some people are born with great physical gifts. Some people are not. Some people are born crack addicted. Some people are born with tons of money. Some people aren't. You can be born with tons of money and end up a crack addict. You can be born with nothing and end up a billionaire. That's the promise of America. Equality, that, that nothing in the system will stop you doing something based on an immutable characteristic. That's what we have. Now, the reason it shifted to equity, partly it's the self-preservation thing that you talked about. Now you've got all of these nonprofits. You have all of mm -hmm. these think tanks. You have this entire cottage industry of people who are fighting for something. Now, they get gay marriage. Do you think the next day they're all like, okay, guys, let's wrap it up. Let's close up shop, close up the what office. What are you going to do for a living? I'm job. thinking about starting a bakery. What are you going to do? Nobody, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Good. It was good working with you guys. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. So now you have a huge sector that had had actually accumulated an awful lot of power by fighting for the right thing in this case. Although I think you can actually argue there were all sorts of problems in the Supreme Court decision and it should have been done fully at the state level, which was happening. Mm -hmm. But let's just put that aside for a second. But you had people who fought for equality. You get equality. Now all these people have to figure out what to do. But not just that. And here's where I think you could go into a little bit of a conspiracy thing. Now, the system, whatever you want to call it, the system, the, the machine, whatever it is, it now sees, oh, you can get an awful lot of people to buy into something um, by, by being actually pretty uh, overly emotional constantly, calling all of your opponents bigots and racists and homophobes and everything else. And then you get some of the algorithm stuff on that. And then in comes Trump. And then Trump comes in, and Trump was on stage before he was president with a rainbow flag. He's the first, first, first time president that was ever for gay marriage. Barack Obama was not. Right. So, you know, the progressives, the progressives of 2040 are going to burn down the Obama library in retrospect because <laughs> it'll, in essence, it'll be like, he you was know, I laugh for and you I joke, mean, but that's an, that's an actual somewhat probable outcome. I mean, why not? Oh, right. It's probable. <laughs> Yes, yeah. it is probable. You, you said it before. It's about perpetual revolution. So right. this will not end well for Obama. It can't end well for Obama. Obama, who was using drone strikes to kill Americans overseas and, you know, all of the stuff. He, he deported more 
Uh, I think he deported more illegals uh, even than George W. Bush. I mean, there's a, there's a litany of things they're going to come after Obama for. But then you just take this situation where we got equality, and then what was next for the activist class, and then the, the big tech thing to just keep us all distracted and clicking and all of that stuff, and then you usher in equity, you usher in this cultural Marxism, this sudden new upset. It was almost as if the second gay marriage was done, which again was a worthy cause in my view, then immediately suddenly we're obsessed with race again. We had almost, we had almost killed racism in America. As you just said, we're basically the same age. For us growing up, there was, racism was not a thing. It was so over and done and nobody cared. We didn't have shows that were racist. No, nobody cared. Nobody cared. And now they've made, they've brought it back, and it's back on steroids. No, you know what? I really do think Gen X was the closest to aspirational, not, I don't believe in, um, I don't believe in racial, what is it, color blindness. I don't believe in that. I think that's dumb to, pursue, to pretend that we can't see the differences in one another. But Gen X was the closest to arriving at a place where it didn't matter, it, or it mattered, but we could put yeah. it into the proper context of how much it mattered in our personal relationships. And then came along the, pre, the, the subsequent generations who pushed it right back up to the top of your priority list, which, which I totally agree with you, by the way. Neo-racism, the return of racism, whatever we call it, it's racism. Um, but I wanted to ask you about something that you brought up well, earlier. Me, I'll tell you this. Please, we, you, please. Wait, real quick, you mentioned, because yeah. you mentioned some of the references of, of being our age. My two heroes growing up my two heroes this is one the first one sort of sad what happened but my hero growing up was bill cosby i remember seeing bill cosby himself his hbo special i saw it in 1983 i remember exactly where i was sitting in my parents then i could not believe anything could be that funny it changed my life as a first or second grader i then wanted to make people laugh i thought it was the greatest thing ever so now here you have a seven six or seven year old kid growing up on the island thinking that this black comedian is the funniest thing he's ever seen. And he was my hero. I, I absolutely adored the guy. And okay, fine. His life then turned in, in different ways. And then my sports hero was Clyde Drexler. Another black, he happens to be black. It had nothing to do with him being black. The guy had a sick dunk and, you know, he had an awesome finger roll. But my heroes in, in that way. I love Tina Turner. She happens to be black too. Like, we had almost got there. There was, it had nothing to do with them being black. She was an awesome singer. He was an awesome ball player. The other guy mm -hmm. was a great comedian. None of it mattered. It, it really didn't matter. It never even popped into my head that, that they were black in any sense like that. But now, now it's back, and that, that's really depressing. And it really did start with Obama, which, which is odd. We achieved this moment in history where it's clearly a mark of a society who's beginning to move beyond race. And then whiplash, race once again in that moment, became the most important issue in American culture. Will, remember the moment, what was it, Donald Trump's second State of the Union when he talked about lowest all-time black and Latino unemployment and the Congressional Black Caucus sat there like this, yeah. arms crossed, and they did not applaud? You have all of the Republicans, all of the old white Republicans applauding low black unemployment. You have Trump in the Oval Office, that famous picture where he's got about 100 black business leaders standing with him. And, and he's talking about all-time low black unemployment. I mean, think about how good things were three years ago until mm. they decided to bring in the race riots and until they decided, where did Antifa go? Where did BLM go over these last couple of years? So this is where the conspiracy stuff is. Some of this coordinated. To me, some of this has to be coordinated. We had all of this stuff about police brutality and, and you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we're allowed to be out on the streets protesting if you're protesting with BLM, but then you got to go home and put the plastic bag on your head again. Some of that is coordinated, and it was coordinated to get rid of Trump because Trump yes. was post-racial. He really was. You know Trump's answer on the trans thing? Have you ever heard him say this? I think this is like the greatest thing the guy ever said. They said to him, Trump, remember, because remember a couple years ago, I think this was before he was president, actually. Remember there was the issue, I think it was in North Carolina, with trans bathrooms, and Obama said, we're going to cut federal funding unless they add a third bathroom, something to that effect. And they asked Trump about this. And maybe this was just when he was running for president. He said, I don't care about the bathrooms. He said, I'm a builder. I build hotels. If you tell me I can build one bathroom for everybody, that's great. That tells you what you need to know about Trump, that the guy was there for reality. He was there mm. for a bottom line. 
he did not care. You think Donald Trump cared whether you were a biological man and you dressed as a woman? He's done some stuff in his day. He didn't care about <laughs> race. It was just so obvious. So I wanted to ask you about this, which you alluded to just a moment ago. It's one of the most fascinating parts of you in, in my mind. And that, that is that you built this career outside the system. Um, at this point, you're, you're very well diversified. You have a new book, which we're going to talk about. You've written several books. You have your show, which airs on The Blaze. But you really built most of this through social media. You built your show, Ruben Report, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know there was times at the Young Turks and other places, through YouTube. And I got to think, Dave, I, your timing was great. I was looking at when you launched your shows. and I, <laughs> No, I really, yeah. you know, Joe Rogan's in Europe on his show, and I'm, I mean, I'll, I call it the way I see him. He's one of the, the best, but Joe also absolutely benefits of the launch of the timing of his podcast. A oh, lot yeah. of people do. You've got to meet the market when the market demands it. And you were on YouTube at just the right time. However, what a terrible place to, I would think, to build a business. Or, or maybe it wasn't always and now it is. But the, the frequency from which, of which you must be getting demonetized or, look, man, I'm not, as you said, I'm not much of a social media guy. I haven't tried to, it's been a real problem for me, honestly, if I'd have invested. I just hate it. I hate social media, um, but I, but You're doing I'm gonna tell you something. Right in a way. Like a month of investing in Facebook, dinged, demonetized. Uh, you know, within a month, and you're building an yep. entire career on these platforms. How has that been? So first off, you're right. The timing thing is true. Timing is everything. Why does that phrase exist? Because it's not just that you have to do something good, hopefully, and you know, build a good product or do a good talk show or whatever you, whatever skill you have. It's not just that you can refine that skill and get there. Uh, you have to have the timing, meaning that the world is ready. You need all of the vehicles, all of the tech, whatever it is, to get that message out there. So yeah, I was early in on the uh, on the YouTube side, and here's where you know, for whatever. Uh, feelings I have about the Young Turks Network politically, I will give them credit. They were in before me. So Jank, who founded mm -hmm. it, the guy did, he did, you know, he's done a really awful job, I think, politically and has created a, a tremendous amount of chaos and much of what's wrong with the progressive movement has come from him and that they don't have the influence that they once did, which I think is good. But I will give the guy credit. He saw the digital landscape changing or he saw the, the media landscape changing and he saw the digital avenue. So that's part of success in general. You want to be early in. You want to be one of the first movers, all of that sort of thing. So I was still early in on that. But I think the thing that I really did do well, if, if I did one thing well throughout this, is at all the moments where the fork hit me, where the road started to split, I've somehow been able to make the right choice. So, for example, I was crowdfunding my show for years on uh, Patreon. And then mm -hmm. Patreon started banning people because of speech. And I said, all right, this, I don't want to be associated with this. It's, I can't run a business like this. I can't, I can't get 80% of my rev where I'm paying all of my employees from a company that could literally just take me out like that. So right. that's when I started my own subscription network, which I built myself. That ultimately became Locals, which then became right. a really big company that now we've since merged with Rumble. So I, I then, and that was a choice too, to say, okay, now I've got Locals, it's cooking, We've done something really well for independent creators. Here's Rumble. They've got great backing, great tech. And then we decided to merge together. So I have a few moments like that, leaving the Young Turks to go to another network. I went to Larry King's Aura TV for a while. That kind of worked. And then I wanted to go independent because I thought, well, I don't really need a network anymore. That doesn't really work for me. So there, at all the moments where I felt there's a chance, you know, you all, everyone has a certain amount of times in life where they actually take a chance. I've taken about five chances of giving up salary, giving up health insurance, bringing my team with me or whoever was willing to come and then make, making the right choice. So as far as building all this stuff, yeah, look, YouTube could shut me down tomorrow. I believe that there are differences biologically between men and women and I say it on my show. So I am there, but yeah. by the grace of Susan Wojcicki, the YouTube CEO, they could take me out. But I have all my stuff on Locals. I have all my stuff on Rumble. Uh, we're building better products because these things will fail. They will fail. The, the woke virus will destroy these products. If for no other reason, then think about it this way. When, once you go woke, once these companies go woke, they no longer hire the best people. Because when they're hiring, and they have to hire tons of engineers, they have to hire programmers, you know, every level of a tech stack, right? Well, once you say, okay, 
we're not going to hire the best engineers. We're going to hire based on, we, we need a couple lesbian engineers and we need a couple uh, black trans engineers, et cetera, et cetera. Over time, you will degrade the product. Not because there can't be a great black trans engineer. Of course there can be. But no, if because you're you've, primary yeah. mover. Yeah, you got it. Everyone got it. So what I've done here is I don't care if my guys are black or white or gay or straight or it makes yeah. no difference. Are you the best at what you do? And trust me, every time I put up a, an ad for, for an employee, we are inundated. And, and really think how crazy it would be if I was like, yeah, you know, uh, we have 500 resumes here. Can I just get the, uh, the trans ones? Give me the trans ones and then I'll pick <laughs> from that. Do you think I would be building a good business? Of course not. So I think it was, it was a little bit of timing, but then it was making, it was making the right decision, seeing the lay of the land and, and, and really, you know, seeing the forest for the trees. The reverse well, of what most people do. Well, it's one of the things I respect about what you've done the most. Um, you've been an absolute entrepreneur in this career and built yourself up to the heights. I mean, you're incredibly smart and a deep thinker and articulate your positions very well. But it takes a lot of bravery and balls, quite honestly, to build it outside the system. And it's awesome. What a success you've built. Tell me about Don't Burn Thank This you. Country. Or after, um, you know, don't. Please, what is it? Please don't burn this book. I can't remember if you asked please or not. <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> no, was, but distinguish the book for me. No, there was no please. Or just, just a dictate. Do not burn this book, and now do not burn this country. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, the next book may be please don't burn me. I think that's probably where <laughs> you'll this ask thing please is. on that one, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's where this is all headed. Well, the, look, the first book, Don't Burn This Book, was me laying out the principles that I believe in. If, uh, if anyone hasn't read it or doesn't sort of get it after listening to us, it, these are classically liberal principles that America was founded on. But in a modern context, they're thought of as conservative principles. But in essence, I believe in the individual. I believe in laissez-faire economics. The government shouldn't do that much. I believe in states' rights. I believe in family. I believe in God-given rights. Uh, some people, you know, can call them human rights. But I believe the government did not make you free. It can protect your rights, but it, it did not give them to you in the first place. Um, and if you believe roughly that, then believe it or not, most people are classical liberals. But the word liberal has just been demolished and destroyed for some of the reasons that we've talked about here. So they're thought of now as sort of conservative or libertarian principles. So that, that was the first book. And then I thought, well, we have a real problem because despite uh, writing a, a pretty good selling book on those principles... The woke monster is here, and it's coming for everything, as we talked about. It's coming for our corporations, Disney. It's coming through our in educational institutions, where they're teaching literally second graders that boys are girls and girls are boys. Uh, it's coming more, you know, we can keep going with the educational thing, where, you know, non-racism is now racism. It's melting down all of our systems. And mm -hmm. I think we have to start figuring out ways to fight back. And now the question is... And I would say this is one of those forks in the road moment for me. The question is, do you go in back into all of those institutions and try to save them? Or do you blaze some new trails? And I grappled with this for years. I had a lot of people on my show talking about this. I think the old institutions are all going down. I, I actually do not think they are savable. I think that the woke, the woke thing is a parasite. And when it's in the system, every system that we've seen it in, it destroys that system. It's why everything is melting down right now. What we you know, need I, to do, and this is, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Dave, I, I, I've gone back and forth on this as well. I'm sorry to interrupt you because I want to hear all of what the book no, no. entails. But I've gone back and forth on this as well. Do we want to create, do we need to create parallel systems that hold true to eternal principles, quite honestly? Um, or do you have to infiltrate and take back over the, the, the legacy institutions? I had Seth Dillon from the Babylon Bee on the show the other day. Yep. And he's certainly somebody that believes in you have to be in the legacy institutions. You have to take these back over. They're too powerful. They're too important. I see the entrepreneurial opportunities of Locals.com and Rumble, and I think – I, I agree with what you had to say. I mean, you just go create positive things. You don't have to tear down the negative things. But I've gone back and forth. I think I'm closer to your side of this, the parallel economy side. Right. So I don't know that there's a purely right answer. I think there's a way to do both. You know, look, first off, I like Seth a lot. I've interviewed him. I've, I've had dinner with him. Totally nice guy. Babylon B, as far as I know, as we're talking right now, is still suspended on Twitter. That's so right. He may want in on those things. They may not let him back in. So he needs. And by the way, he has it. You know, they, they have their own subscription site. We've done some work with them on, on locals. 
But the truth is, if big tech wanted to shut him down completely today, blow up the entire thing, they absolutely could do it. So I'm not saying that intellectually he's wrong in terms of should you fight on that front? You know, it's a war. We're at an ideological war. I think you have to fight in many ways. But we're all wired a little bit differently. I'm wired more to build new things. So I think we need the parallel economy. And what I mean by that is Mm -hmm. we built locals at first to be a Patreon replacement. Okay, that's one thing. Rumble is a YouTube replacement, but it's not just a YouTube replacement. It's also an Amazon AWS replacement. Without getting too technical, AWS, that's the system that, it's called Amazon Web Services. That's the system that runs the internet. So when Parler, yeah. after January 6th, they blew up Parler because all Amazon had to do to take out the competition, it had nothing to do with January 6th, which was coordinated far more on Facebook than on Parler, but they saw a new, a new guy on, in town. And they did a mafia move. They said, new guys in town, take them out. I mean, this is right out of The Sopranos. What would you do when someone's encroaching on your territory? You take them out. And all they did was, I don't know if it's a touch button or a lever or what, but they pushed the thing. They blew up Parler. By the way, I'll just tell you real quick. I had had meetings with Parler about locals, and I kept telling them, guys, you have major problems. You have a Death Star little vent problem. And they just kept saying, nah, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. So they, they made some of their own mistakes. Um, but so now we've got a Patreon replacement with locals. We've got a YouTube and AWS replacement with Rumble because that's what Rumble's doing, building some awesome infrastructure. We need everything parallel. When you talk about parallel, we need parallel payment processors. Uh, we can't just use Stripe or PayPal because they could choke us off. So we need right. that. But it's not just that. We need a parallel economy, Will, when it comes to literally plumbers and when it comes to electricians. And it comes to everything because once wokeism is in, they will start deciding who can get service and who you're allowed to. I mean, this is what the ESG score that Glenn Beck is always talking about. Uh, Banks Mm -hmm. will decide who they can lend to and all of those things. In essence, we need we need a parallel economy. And and I would say bigger than that, we need a parallel world. And it will only come if we build it. I'm also here in Miami right now where they had the Bitcoin conference last week. There's so much energy in the decentralized space. Um, you know, a little of it's sort of crazy future, but some of it's tangible and real. And we got a lot of stuff we got to figure out. But again, that's not to say you don't play with the old things and try to figure it out. Um, but I think the, the only alternative, you go to the promised land. Even if you don't even know where the promised land is, you got to go find it. If you got to walk in the desert for 40 years, go do it because something will show up. And it's inspirational because it's a positive direction in which to move, and people are starving for a positive direction. And, I mean, just from a superficial, you could be the next Dave Rubin, you know. You could be an entrepreneur. You could start this positive movement. Man, I've been excited to talk to you for quite some time. I'm glad we got to spend so much time together. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person one day and really appreciate you being on the podcast today. Will, come on down. I'm going to put two tickets aside April 24th. I'm taking the book tour to, to Dallas. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the theater off the top of my head, but Glenn Beck's opening for me. I'm going to get you some tickets. And, uh, the 23rd to, and 24th, hopefully I'm, not, hopefully I'm not in Talladega, Alabama for Fox and Friends. If I'm here, I'll be there. All right. Well, I'm going to send you the, send you the stuff. We'll figure it out. All right, Dave. Thank you, man. Thanks, man. Really enjoyed it.